What's up guys, my name is Adam Balazs, welcome to the Malawi documentary, it's nice to see your smiling faces again. We are already at the third episode, so if you are new here, don't forget to watch the previous two episodes. Today, let's dive deep into our daily life in Malawi. I am going to talk about where we lived, what we ate, what we could do in our spare time, and I will show you guys some of the disturbing behind the scenes things that happen and the pure but magical reality in Malawi that you might have seen only in movies. Pause the video, take some popcorn, fasten your seatbelts and get ready because this is going to be an interesting one. Let's go! Do you remember where we finished the first video? That's right, we are just arrived to Chikwela. Oh, it's too dark like this, you can't see a damn thing. Turn the lights up, that's better. Welcome to the Billions Residence. For more than one and a half months, Lily and I were hosted by our dear friend Anderson Fry Billy at the head of the Malawi. For the time being, we lived in his home with his wonderful little family that consists of his wife, Lavnas, their four children and their maid. They welcomed us with an open heart, cooked for us and we learned most of the things about life in Malawi from them. It was really a mind-blowing experience, so I want to say a huge thank you for them. The landlocked country ranks among the world's least developed countries. Its economic performance has been historically been constrained by policy inconsistency, macroeconomic instability, poor infrastructure, rampant corruption, high population growth, poor health and education outcomes that limit labor productivity. The economy is predominantly agricultural, with about 80% of the population living in rural areas. Especially the southern part of Malawi, Sanja and Chikova is one of the, if not the poorest areas of the country which is something that you can see just by looking at the city and its buildings. Most of the houses are small and preliminary, with mud or in better cases brick walls, and the bare minimum equipment in them. The family we were hosted by were fortunately among the few families in the area who had fairly huge houses with brick walls, windows and roof. But as you can see, this doesn't comparable with the houses that the average people in Europe normally experience. However, we felt extremely lucky because of their situation. Let me show you around in the house. It was quite big, which is needed because 10 people can take up plenty of space. At the front side there is a huge balcony, which we got familiar with early on, and we use every single day. You can imagine when it's 40 Celsius outside and there is no AC, the only thing could make the weather bearable was the nice, fairly cool shadow and wind on the balcony. From there, through the entrance, you would find yourself in the living room and dining room, where is a big couch for the family, a small table and unexpectedly a TV. Further into the house, there is a long hallway that stretches between the two ends of the building with a small kitchen in the middle. The right side of the house was the forbidden area for the two of us. Even if it wasn't thought, we didn't go there since the family had their living space with several rooms and bathroom there. Of course we wanted to respect their private space so we figured we shouldn't go there without any invitation. Vice versa, we got the left side of the house and its only room including the bathroom. That was our sleeping quarter. In the room nothing extra, we had two beds in the middle although we used only one of them for sleeping. The other one was kind of a shaft where we kept all kind of things. A table on the side with chair and basically that's it. By the first glance you can see the house is not in the best shape ever. The bricks are out, there is no isolation, painting or any kind of decorative elements on the outside. And this is the bathroom, or at least it's supposed to be that. We had our own and only English toilet in the house, uh, although it didn't have the seat on it, and uh, there's tap and some sort of shower. I want to tell you guys something. Through both of our life, we loved extreme things, edgy situations, going to the woods, do camping, hiking, participating in nomad activities, where you can't shower for a day or two. You know, when you have to go back to the old school way, when there is no internet, television, just you and the nature. And before we left to Africa, we expected that it's going to be hard, most likely it's going to be uncomfortable, the weather is hot as hell, everything is going to be dirty, it will be exhausting. So we try to prepare for it mentally. But there is no way you can prepare for this 100% because there are just things that hit different when you're experiencing them on your own. So the first two weeks was hard on us. Don't misunderstand me, this was hard because I had to say we are soft as f We have such a good life in Denmark, you don't even realize that some people don't have the same luxury and we forget to appreciate what we have. When we arrived at the house after the extremely long journey and we saw where we are going to stay and we saw the beds, lights and walls, the missing ceiling, the broken windows, holes everywhere and this bathroom, we felt like we are out of our mind and we shouldn't be here. That ceiling, or whatever you would like to call it, with the wooden planks, ropes and spider nets, that's not something that you would like to see on your first night. And the noises coming up from there, they were traumatizing, like something is hunting you, waiting to attack and rip your face off. These are cockroaches. Did you know they can fly? Yeah, me neither. Going back to the fact that we didn't have a proper ceiling, it was funny, annoying and disturbing at the same time. Because our room wasn't the only place in the house missing it. Right next to the room, at the bathroom and the kitchen, also didn't have ceiling on top. And the same applies for the balcony. So every morning when 
the family woke up at 4.30 a.m., started cooking, washing dishes, or just stuck in the kitchen or outside, we could hear everything crystal clear, and it was really hard to get used to that. But we solved the problem and woke up at the same time, so they couldn't disturb our sweet dreams anymore. On the other hand, since there is no ceiling in the bathroom and the kitchen, whenever you would go to use the fight mustang, the bathroom didn't give you the proper privacy. There was one more disadvantage of the missing ceiling. Looking back, it is actually a funny story, but it didn't felt like that at the time. Anything could go up there from the outside world, and what goes up, it comes down eventually. Well, on the first week we got ourselves a mosquito net to hang it above our bed to keep the mosquitoes away while we are sleeping. So we had this thing hanging from the planks on the tiny tiny rope, and for days or even a couple of weeks we felt like something lands on our heads during the nights, but flies away immediately. First we were wondering about a cockroach or some kind of insect. Then on a beautiful morning we could take a glance on this thing and it wasn't a cockroach as we thought. I was brushing my tooth when Liv started screaming, I turned around when a huge mouse jumped on the bed and ran up on the mosquito net's tiny rope to that. So it was a mouse running up and down every single day on our heads. I think I don't need to clarify that we get super frustrated real fast. And the little mouse caused us several sleep last night. It took ages to get that evil thingy and remove it from the house. Unfortunately, this meant for him to leave the living behind and join the army of the dead. According to the USA, 80% of the population has access to improved source of drinking water, but this still leaves around 8 million people lacking access to safe water. Although in theory water in Chihuahua that comes from the tap considered to be safe, it was highly unadvised for us to drink it or use it without the proper filtering or sanitation. Whether we are talking about uh, casual boiling of the water or using different tablets because of the risk of infections and waterborne diseases. In order to tackle the problem, we decided to buy bottled water in the local shops, which were uh, super expensive, but we did not want to risk drinking from the tap. Also, water supplies are a general problem in the area. In the dry season, there could be several days when there is almost no water coming from the taps, and the families have to get water from community wells, where the water comes directly from the deep of the ground, and which could be placed sometimes quite a distance from the houses. We are talking about kilometers in some cases. Imagine bringing the water you are using every day on top of your head in plastic buckets from kilometers away. You will think twice what you are using it for and how much of it. So the family usually had a great supply of water in barrels for kind of emergency purposes. And after the first occasion when we had to skip the shower and couldn't flush the toilet for uh, around 4-5 days, we learned from the professionals and started to collect the water as well. That came in handy many times since we were in the middle of the dry season. Talking about showering, it wasn't really showering. Water didn't drop on the shower head, so our only option was to fill a bucket with cold water and with a plastic glass pour the water on ourselves with one hand and clean ourselves with the other. And we had to do all of these in the dark with a single flashlight because there was no light in the bathroom at all. Also a fun fact, we forgot to bring towels and couldn't buy any. So for one and a half months after each bathing, we were just standing in the middle of the room naked waiting to dry up. When we got to Malawi the summer there, they started to get in close, so it became dark in the evenings early, around 5 pm, and they don't really have like public lights on the streets in the city, so it was super dark. In 99% of the times, we always wanted to get back to the house by that time. The country considered to be safe for tourists, especially in big cities and tourist areas, but we heard strange and horrifying stories. Furthermore, the family also asked us to get home before dark if we are alone, because it is easy to get lost in the dark, and they said it wasn't safe. But fortunately, we never experienced anything like that. The electricity is mostly hydroelectric power that comes from a station in the Shira River that cuts through the Sanje and it was unreliable. Every second or third day there were some blackout. In the evening when it was dark from 5 pm without electricity, it could became super boring and also interesting at the same time because we had to deal with the dark, try to cook, have a bath and live our life anyway without proper light sources. And the sky was amazing in those quiet hours, so we spent a lot of time with stargazing and sitting in quiet under the Milky Way. Hey guys, sorry for jumping in. Uh, while I was cutting the video, I realized it became super long, so I decided to divide it into two parts. So stay tuned, the second part is coming in uh, two weeks on Saturday. Until then, check out the previous episodes if you missed them. Hit the button if you like the video, subscribe if you aren't already, ring the bell, and you know the rest. See you in the next one. Bye.